joining us for the virtual tour of the new uh, temporary exhibit here at the Erna Lee Museum, A Woman's Work is Never Done, 125 Years of Serving Their Communities. My name is Sharifa. And my name is Emily. And we are the curators of the exhibit. So this summer, Emily and I decided, on to take, decided to take on the task of developing an exhibit in just nine weeks. And for those of you who are a little bit familiar with how um, exhibits work, uh, nine weeks can be quite a daunting task. Um, but we are really up for the challenge and we're really happy about the outcome. So we just want to thank everyone for joining us today um, and everyone who has supported us and helped us through this journey. So I guess we're going to get sort of started. Um, our exhibit is called A Woman's Work is Never Done, 125 Years of Serving Their Communities. And the exhibit is to commemorate the upcoming 125th anniversary of the Women's Institute that will be celebrated in 2022. So in our intro section here, we have our banner. We also have our, uh, the Women's Institute badge. So this badge was created by Laura Rose. Um, and she was a unique woman. She was one of the first members, um, or first-ish members, um, and she was in charge of also their motto, so for home and country, as well as the colors, which is a dark bluish, navy blue, and yellowish gold color. So, moving on to our first case here. So we decided to split up our exhibit um, in a few different ways. Uh, we will focus on a single location as well as a different time period. So we decided that there was no better place to start than at the very beginning. So this case is um, all about Stony Creek um, and it's from the 1890s to the 1920s. So for those of you who are not familiar, the Women's Institute started on February 19th, 1897. Um, and it was born in the Lee family's homestead that was then known as Edgemount. So in our case, we have a couple of, uh, of photographs of, the, of, the, of our founding mothers and fathers of the Women's Institute. So we have Christina Smith down here, who was the first president. Um, she was also known as the wife of Edie Smith. So if you're eating you know, jam and bread in the morning, um, hopefully you think of Christina Smith as well as Edie Smith. Uh, we also have over here um, in number A is a picture of the 25th anniversary. We thought it would be really unique to see how the ladies and, and gentlemen, Earl and Lee, um, celebrated then. You may recognize the photos from our Instagram, so it is our, our marketing photo. And number B, we have a picture of Laura Rose. Um, so as I mentioned before, she was the creator of the Women's Institute badge, their motto, and their official colors. Over here, we have a commemorative plate, um, and it just gives a little, little bit of a backstory of, of, the, of the Women's Institute. Over here um, is the, section, the second section. It is uh, the Air Community. So the Air Community, like many communities, were really, really um, active in their years. Um, and I'll give it off to Emily to tell you a little bit more about them. So the Air Community actually has quite a bit of, they're Tweedsmere books. So Tweedsmere's are history books started by the WR, kind of like a scrapbook for local history. And the Air Community actually has a lot of them, and the Air Public Library has digitized most, if not all, of theirs, which we were super lucky to have so that we can actually do a lot of research about the Women's Institute because there isn't a whole lot available. Most people keep their tweezers to themselves. <laughs> so in the case, we have a couple of fun things. So we actually have the 75th anniversary cake. Well, it's a, it's a model of the cake that was celebrated for the 75th anniversary. We also have a booklet about home economics because home economics was super important for the WI, as well as the newspaper article and some photos of women that were in the, the WI. The top photo with the five ladies is actually the very first Tweedsmere committee for air. So now we're going to pass it back to Sharifa. So our third case focuses on the western and northern branches and really focuses on the eras between 1960 and the 1990s. Um, so for the western branches, they were really um, adamant about fighting for social welfare. So they really worked for uh, their whole community, families and individuals alike. 
those earlier programs were really just centers um, that served the community. So they, they helped with building libraries, um, communal halls, um, they had charities that would help children in need. Um, so that was the work of the Western um, branches and still is today. The Northern branches were inspired by the Western branches um, work. And so they took on their social welfare, but they also focused a lot on adult education in order to assist uh, the community. So just to give you a little bit of a backstory, so I can uh, tell you about the pictures here, um, on how uh, the West took on the ideals of, of the Women's Institute in Ontario. So as the wide open space in the early 1900s, the wide open space of the Western provinces called to a lot of men and farmers, um, they, in the end, brought their wives and families with them, which meant for women who grew up in Ontario, they were really missing the landscapes of Ontario, all like the rivers and the hills. Um, and as we know, um, out west, there's a lot of plains. <laughs> so um, if life um, in Ontario, if rural life in Ontario was a little bit more, was lonely there, um, it was really lonely out in the West. So as women moved out to the West, they brought the ideals and values of the Women's Institute with them. And slowly, more and more branches started to open up in the West. As I mentioned, they influenced the North and more and more branches opened up in the North. So as those branches opened up, uh, the, the Women's Institute actually was able to be federated and a new organization was born. It was known as the Federated Women's Institute of Canada, the FWIC. And so here, um, number B, we have a picture of Emily Murphy. And she is an amazing lady. She was the first president of the FWIC. She was also a lawyer and one of the first female magistrates of Ontario. So, of Canada, sorry, not Ontario, of Canada. Um, her story is unique in the sense that um, when her first court proceeding was uh, happening um, as a judge, um, it was immediately canceled because she was no longer, no, she was not known as a person. And to be a person in the early 1900s, you had to be male, and Emily Murphy was not. So she fought really, really hard with four other Albertan women um, to fight for the rights that women could be considered as people. Um, they were eventually known as the Famous Five. So if you've ever been to um, Ottawa and you've been to Parliament and you've seen those, I believe they're metal, statues of the ladies sitting down having tea and looking at proclamations, um, that is them. And one of them was the, the first president of the FWIC. Um, also, the, the Women's Institute also um, influenced not just the nation, but worldwide. And so, in 1929, um, the Associated Countries Women of the World was founded, um, and just the ideals of the Women's Institute was brought worldwide. So over here in picture C, we have a picture of Florence Matheson, and she was a president of the ACWW. Um, and in that picture, she is presenting an award to an Indigenous woman from the, one of the northern branches um, for her craftsmanship. Um, as a prize. So the Women's Institute was really, really um, adamant about working for um, women's education in rural areas. So as Emily mentioned, we have our program books, but they're also really crafty women. So they, they had their, their, their quilts, they had their dolls, and one of the examples we have here is of our 90th doll, um, and it's to represent the 90th anniversary of the Women's Institute. Also in our case, we have a couple of commemorated plates and teacups, um, just, to, just to show that they, they really, they really love their organization um, and they were really determined to do the work of the Women's Institute. In our fourth case here, uh, we decided to bring this location all the way to PEI, um, and the errors are from the 2000 to the 2020, so today. Um, I think we can all agree that 2020 has been quite a whirlwind of events uh, for not just us, but the world. Um, and so we, we've had everything between forest fires, to protests, to famine. And I think one of the biggest uh, setbacks was uh, the outbreak of COVID-19. So as COVID-19 uh, became more and more prominent in different countries, um, and then we all eventually went into lockdown around the same time in March, um, many people thought about what they could do 
um, to continue on with life, how should they act, um, what comes next for their future. Um, the PIWI, so the Prince Edward Island Women's Institute, realized a need for two of their long-term long care homes. Um, and so they took action right away. They sewed about 500 masks in 48 hours um, and provided it to their community, to those long-term care homes in need. Um, their work has been recognized not only in the media, um, but by the world as well. Uh, they are still making masks today. They have partnered with the Queen Elizabeth Hospital Foundation, and together they are doing a mask project where uh, the WY members, they sew masks together, and uh, they sell them online on the, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital Foundation website for $10, and all the funds that are raised goes to buying COVID-19 relief gear for the hospital. So if you're interested, you can go online and purchase some, uh, purchase some masks. But in our case here, we have a picture of um, a WI volunteer sewing mask, um, and that is picture B. In picture C, we have some examples of the masks that they have. And we thought that it would be really, really cool to incorporate um, some of their 100th anniversary um, items. So in the back there, we have the Queen Mum at the Walmer Castle Kent um, branch, and she is planting a maple tree for the 100th anniversary. We also, at the bottom, have the Women's Inst Institute Centennial Song that was written in 1994. And Emily. So our final case here goes from 2020 onwards. So this case is actually looking at the future of the WI. This is the oldest women's in, or women's organization in the world, and we like to keep it going for a very long time. So for this case, we actually thought it'd be a really cool idea to ask current WI members. So members from all across the country, we have Stony Creek, we have a lot from Ontario, we have Saskatchewan, we have PEI, we have a lot of different women. We asked them to share their thoughts and their hopes for the future of the WI. And in this case, as you can see, we have all of these quotes listed. And then behind the quotes, we also have a tea towel that has the flags of all the countries involved in the WI, just to show how widespread this organization is. And then behind me, we have our programming stuff. So for this exhibit, we thought it'd be really fun to make it a little bit more interactive because it is quite a bit of reading. <laughs> and we thought it'd be fun to include some trivia questions, as you can see all the way along. We have different trivia questions about the WI. They're all little flip-up questions like that. And then on the very far end, right at the end of our exhibit, we have a selfie mirror. So it's kind of like those carnival cutouts that we had as kids, but this one's a little bit more appropriate for the environment that we live in today. So we can just take a picture as a Victorian baby if we'd want to. And we also have some post-its and some stickers, some post-its and some pens that anybody can write down their hopes or their, their thoughts about the Women's Institute, and then we'll post them all around our lovely mirror. We have also included over here a scrapbook, kind of like our own tweeds mirror, of the different other sources that we had when we were doing our research and anything that we thought would be extra information that would be fun to include throughout the exhibit. So we have all of this other fun information as well. We want to flip through it a little bit. And then finally, we over here we have some quilts. So the Early Lee Museum has quite an extensive quilt collection, and we thought it would be fun to include some of those quilts because the WI made a lot of quilts. They continue to make a lot of quilts. It's kind of a big part of the organization. So we have our top one here, the red and white one, is actually a signature quilt. So it has the signatures of all the women that participated in making it. The one next to it, the blue cross, or the, the double T patterned one, is just, I just thought it was pretty. <laughs> I thought it was just a nice cover to have to kind of include. Down at the bottom, our quilt C is actually another signature quilt made by the South Wentworth Women's Institute, and it was actually made in 1984 as a commemoration for their celebrations. And then last but not least, we have our 75th anniversary for one of the local branches. It has the home and country badge like we saw at the beginning of our exhibit. And I'm back to Sharifa. <laughs>
so that is basically the extent of the temporary exhibit that we've worked on. Um, we just want to thank everyone again um, who has tuned in to be a part of this first virtual look of the exhibit, um, as well as everyone who has helped us. Uh, we just want to say a special thank you to all of the WI members um, and branches we reached out to for their, their thoughts on the, on the organization and for their help with the creation. Um, I just want to say a special thank you to Ellen McBell, who was from the PEI WI institution, Karen from the Saskatchewan uh, uh, Women's Institution, and then Connie Grinnell from the South Vancouver Women's Institution, and all your members and branches as well. Um, it has been such a pleasure to work here uh, this summer and together on this project. We're really, really happy. Um, and we can't wait for uh, the eventual reopening of the museum so everyone can come in and see the exhibit for themselves and participate in our interactives um, and to see the hard work we put in. We should also say a special thank you to the Stony Creek branch and local ladies who have helped us tremendously through this entire project, especially those who also help out with the museum because they have been a huge resource for us throughout this whole thing. And finally, Tamara Benjamin, oh, who's the curator, <laughs> and she's also filming for us. Um, she has been super, super supportful through this whole thing. Um, we couldn't have done it without her. She always says she didn't do much, but, but, she support, did everything but support is everything. So we are really happy. We can't wait to you guys eventually see. Stay tuned on the, on the Instagram and our other social medias to see when the museum will reopen. But until then, I hope everyone stays safe and uh, stay well. Bye. <laughs>